Today's gospel reading comes out of the 22nd chapter of Matthew, verses 34 to 40. And in today's gospel reading, Jesus offers to all of us two commandments. Now, these two commandments are not to be confused with the original Ten Commandments that God gave to Moses up there in Mount Sinai, recorded in the Old Testament. But the two commandments Jesus offers us today in the original Ten Commandments, they're all different in word and directive, but they are all commandments. And a commandment is something that Jesus, God, commands us to do. So a commandment is not a suggestion. It's not think about it and see if you want to do it. It's not give and take. It's not we'll talk about what you like and what you don't like. These are commandments. And the two commandments God gives us today is telling us, this is what I demand that you do. That's why the commandments. So let's take a look at the two commandments he offers to all of us today. 22nd chapter Matthew verses 36 to 39. It starts off by saying teacher, so they're addressing Jesus as teacher, which commandment of the law is the greatest? He, Jesus, said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with, your heart, with the Lord your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, as you look at those two commandments, what I'm going to ask you is this. Try to figure out in those two commandments what one word thematically dominates those two commandments. Let's just review those. The one commandment is this. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. At the very bottom. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, when you look at those two commandments, out of those four verses, out of the 22nd chapter of Matthew, what is the word that dominates thematically those two commandments? Love. You're exactly right. Let's take a look to see if we're right about that. Love. Love is a powerful, powerful word. It turns out to be, it is as effective in our lives as gravity. It holds everything together. Love. Love can break a heart. Love puts a heart back together. The lack of love can destroy a family. And the appearance of love can put a family back together. The lack of love causes racial tension and divide. Why all the racial tension and divide, many people ask nowadays. It's clear. It's a lack of love. And when you have love, and you love your brother and your sister, you love people as yourself, no matter who they are, what they are, where they are, no matter the status, then what happens? All that racial tension goes away. Now, a lot of people say, we need a leader who's going to get rid of racial tension and and hatred and animosity and acrimony. Who's going to be that leader? A Christian should never ask that question. Why should a Christian not ask the question, who's going to be the leader that puts us back together? Because we already have one. Jesus. 2,000 years ago, Jesus told us, commanded us what to do. A lot of people walking around, scratching their head, trying to figure out who's going to get rid of the racial tension, the racial divide, who's going to get rid of the acrimony, the anger. We need a leader. We've had one now for 2,000 years. That's why a Christian should never ask that question. Because for a Christian to try to figure out what leader, what elected official is going to bring us together, they are already demoting and closing their eyes off to the greatest leader, the one they claim they're following, which is Jesus, because he told us what to do. Jesus commanded, love the Lord your God with all your mind, heart, and soul. And then he said, love your neighbor as yourself. He told us that 2,000 years ago. So why should we be confused as to who's going to do it? All we have to do is what? We have to do it. You see, what happens is this. I can't change the next guy. And so when you listen to these talk shows, which I don't, sometimes I only hear them when I'm flipping the channel and you stay there for about 10 seconds and I move on. But they always seem to be predicated on how to change the other people. When all we have to do is what? Work on yourself. I am in control of just one person. Just me. I can't change you. I can't make you do what I want you to do. 
I just have to work on myself. So I say to myself, Kenny, follow the commandments, not suggestions, not give and take, the commandments of Christ and God. I love him with all my heart, mind, and soul. Love my neighbor as myself. If I can do that, then if you can do that, and the next guy can do that, guess what happens? The world becomes a better place. If you focus on the other and take your eyes off of yourself and make it the other guy's job to make this world a better place, and then you strut off saying, too bad everyone else is like they are, and you don't change, nothing will. You see, love is difficult. Love is sacrifice. Love is selfless, not selfish. I'm going to give you an example of love. One of the great examples of love I've ever run across in my life. In my former assignment, I would stay mass at this nursing home every Friday. Every Friday, I went to this nursing home, William Penn Care Center, Marysville. And I would say mass at one o'clock, and after I said mass, I'd go to the rooms of the residents who could not make it to mass because they were incapacitated in various degrees. The whole process would take me about three hours. Now in this nursing home, right when you first entered, they had this little cafe, a little coffee shop. And so what I would do is, when I'd go to the same mass every Friday, and I would take communion to the residents who could not make it to mass, once I got completed and I was walking out of the building with my mask kit, I would stop at the coffee shop. And I would have myself a nice warm cup of coffee. I love my coffee. And then I would just sit there, and that was like my reward for job. I'm not too sure if it was a job well done, but for the, for the ministry I performed that afternoon, I just treated myself to coffee. Now, this one day, I get to the coffee shop after I finish, and there are two senior fellas, probably in their 80s. They're sitting on separate tables. They're having a lively conversation. I get into the coffee shop, and, and I make my coffee, and I sit down on a third table. And before long, they invited me into their conversation. So the three of us are having this lively conversation from this some distance between us. This is pre-COVID. We're already following social distancing guidelines back then. No one was angry about it because no one wants to sit together. Anyway, we're having this lively conversation, and one senior said to the other senior fella, how often do you come here to the nursing home? And he said, I come here every day to visit my wife. I get here 8 o'clock in the morning, and I stay at 8 o'clock at night, and I take two breaks, and this is break number one for me today. And he said to him, well, your wife must be really pleased and happy that you come here every day, you spend the entire day with her, and he said this, she doesn't even know I'm here. How can that be? How can she not know you're here? He said, my, life, my wife has been dealing with aggressive Alzheimer's. She hasn't literally known me in years, despite the fact we've married for 60 years. She doesn't know who I am. She doesn't recognize and know her children. She doesn't recognize and know her grandchildren. Very often, she doesn't recognize and remember even how to eat. She, she doesn't even know I'm here. She doesn't even know that I sit in her room for all those 12 hours, and I hold her hand, sometimes a rubber forearm. She doesn't even know it. And the fellow said to this man who said he's there every day visiting his wife and she doesn't know he's, she's, he's even there. He said to him, well, I don't understand. If your wife doesn't know who you are, she doesn't know you're there, why do you do it? You know, you could sleep longer, go golfing, enjoy your life. You're retired. Do things. Maybe come here once a week. She doesn't know the difference. She wouldn't even know. And this is what he said which I believe is the ultimate definition of sacrificial love. Right there. Love your neighbor as yourself. And he said this. That's true. My wife doesn't know who I am. But I come here every day because I know who she is. She's my wife. That will never change. I know who she is, I'm here all the time. That sacrificial love. It isn't easy to love. 
It takes effort, it takes work, it takes forgiveness, it takes the ability to overlook, it takes sometimes peripheral vision. If we want everyone to be perfect, they step out of line, we decide not to love them, we'll love no one. Peripheral vision in a horse race is essential because the horse only sees what's in front of him, he doesn't look to the left or to the right. Peripheral vision in love sometimes is a gift. I love this person, I love that person. I don't want to see all the stuff that they're doing. I'm just going to look straight and love them anyway. Love is, love is a challenge. And just think about it. Whose responsibility is it to end acrimony, to end war, to end conflict, to end racial tension, racial divide? All the anger that's going on, whose job is it to end that? No leader. It is my job, it is your job. If I tease myself and pretend like if this person can get elected or that person can get elected, these things will go away, that's wrong. That's putting a job onto someone's shoulders that the job doesn't belong there belongs to you and I. If I want a better world, I have to learn how to love. I have to understand that love takes sacrifice. I have to understand that love takes work. I have to understand that peripheral vision is an attribute when it comes to loving everyone who's different than I. And if I kid myself believing it's his job to change the world, not mine, the world will never change. It starts with me. This man gave an excellent answer. When a fellow stood to him in his coffee shop at this nursing home in which they allowed me to be a part of their conversation, he said, why do you come here every day? Your wife don't even know who you are. And he gave this, a great definition for love. She doesn't know who I am, but I know who she is. Thus, I come here every day. The two commandments Jesus gives to us in the New Testament, in the book of Matthew, the 22nd chapter, they are not suggestions, not give and take, not think about it, not maybe do it, but commandments. They, we are commanded to do it. And when do we start that? We should have started that years ago. Jesus has been saying it for 2,000 years, the ultimate leader. And when you're looking for a leader to change the world, what an injustice you've done to Jesus because he's told you what you needed to do for 2,000 years. It's pretty simple. Love the Lord your God with all your mind, with all your heart, and with all your soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. 